Welcome to Real Christianity. Today we are talking about. Is your worship music teaching false doctrine? Is your worship music teaching false doctrine? A very important conversation. We've been asked to do this episode several times. We've also been wanting to do this episode for quite some time. We're going to talk about really um, the lyrics behind some of these contemporary worship songs as well as how should we be viewing worship music through the lens of scripture. Uh, but before we get started, wanted to uh, have a quick request. If you guys are regular listeners to our show here, uh, we'd ask that you leave a review on iTunes. Um, all you have to do is just tap the stars. It takes like three seconds. Now, if you want to write something, I do review. I do read every single review, and they are so encouraging for those that have left them. Thank you so much. Um, you can also listen to this episode on YouTube, on Spotify. Uh, on Google Play. Um, our YouTube channel has all of our videos that are available. You can also go to relearnchurch.org forward slash listen, and you can see all of our episodes there with all the show notes, the scriptures reference, the videos, everything is there available for you. The next thing I wanted to mention quickly is um, Instagram. Guys, we have an Instagram account for uh, real Christian, or not for real Christianity, for Relearn Church, which kind of encompasses, it's our overall ministry. Um, and you can just find that on Instagram at Relearn Church. And then uh, Ultimate Marriage, which is our another uh, partner ministry uh, where we help build biblical marriages. And then Veronica and I are both on Instagram. So we just want to let you guys know that. Find us there. We post there pretty regularly. If you want to follow our story, um, we'd love to have you guys there. On that note, let's dive in. Veronica is going to open us up. Okay. So worship music. Worship music, I think we can all agree, is is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no argument that God calls us to sing our praises to him mm-hmm. and about him to others. Um, and then this, this idea of singing to the Lord is repeated in the Psalms five times. Mm-hmm. Uh, two of my favorite Psalms, uh, one of them being Psalm 96, 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. And then the other one would be um, Psalm 95, 1. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Mm -hmm. So in the New Testament, um, in Ephesians 5, verse 19, uh, it addresses, or it says, um, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Um, So the use of music in worshiping God is undeniably biblical and Christian. And I think Martin Luther said it quite nicely when he said, The gift of language combined with the gift of song was given to man that he should proclaim the word of God by music. Yeah, so I think that we can all come to the conclusion that that worship and worship music and the idea of singing a song to God is a good thing. It's a mm-hmm. biblical thing. It's a Christian thing. Because sometimes just because it's biblical it doesn't mean it's Christian, right? It could be just that it's included in the Bible. It's the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. But this is a this is a thing that we can all do and I think all uh, enjoy with the Lord. So catch us there that we love worship music mm-hmm. and we often have worship music and hymns playing throughout our house on a regular basis. Um, now I put worship in the same spiritual category as prayer. And what I mean by this is there's a biblical way to do it. Um, You know, for example, the Bible has offered us kind of a model for prayer throughout the scriptures. And Jesus even offers us a direct template, right? You know, the the disciples are asking, how do we pray? And he he actually gives them a direct template uh, for prayer in the New Testament. And the same is true with worship. Um, The Bible offers us a model of worship and spiritual song uh, throughout the scriptures. And Jesus, again, even tells us directly how we should be worshiping um, and how that should be done under the new covenant. And again, I'm going to talk about that passage here in just a second. So just stay with me here. Uh, But first, I wanted to point out the difference between Christian music and worship music. I think that's a really important distinction to make between Christian music and worship music. Christian music is music that really has to do with any Christian idea or Christian virtue. Uh, For example, a lot of uh, the stuff that you hear on Christian radio stations, uh, I I would call Christian music, not necessarily worship music. Um, And I also believe, uh, you know, Christian music, again, not worship music, Christian music offers kind of more capacity, uh, for artistic expression and more liberty and poetry in in that way uh, than worship music does. Uh, And I think this is where a lot of us get in trouble. Uh, We take songs that are Christian songs, 
uh, and use them at church for worship songs. And I think that that's a problem when you have a, a one category that's like got a lot of liberty and again, artistic expression and poetry um, over here. And then you kind of take it into the church where there's there's a different ex- expectation for worship as you're leading other people in their understanding of who God is. Yeah, it goes onto the main stage and you don't even know who's in that audience. A lot of very young, immature believers, a lot of people that aren't even believers. Exactly. And they're looking at, yeah, so this is important stuff, which we'll get here in a second. Um, and this is why we need to be really careful. And you might ask, why? Why do we need to be careful? Well, John uh, 4, 23 through 24, Jesus says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Mm -hmm. And so this is... uh, the, the, the direct context of this verse isn't specifically talking about worship music with God, but it is absolutely talking about a universal truth that God must be worshiped in spirit and truth. So any, any way that you want to worship the Lord, whether that's singing or whether that's writing, it needs to be done in spirit and in truth. So this is a kind of a universal template, uh, that, a principle that would apply to this. And Jesus tells us here that we don't get to worship any way that we want. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't get to worship him with our spirits only. And I, I think, you know, um, I think that biblically speaking, when, when you're saying the spirit, I believe that's kind of the, uh, the heart's relationship with God. Um, kind of the, the uh, I don't want to say emotional because I don't want to elevate it too high, but you get what I'm saying there when you're worshiping, him in, worship, worshiping the Father in spirit. But again, Jesus tells us that we don't get to worship God with our hearts alone. Um, we get to worship God with our hearts, our, our spirit, in combination with truth, in combination with God's truth. So it's not just your heart it's your heart in combination with truth. And that makes a really powerful uh, combination. And I believe Paul actually furthers this idea of, of spirit and truth. Uh, you know, when he defines worship uh, music in, 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 in a way in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, he says, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit And I will also sing with the understanding. I think that's a really important verse here. Yeah, in that passage, Jesus and Paul are teaching Christians that there is is a proper way to worship um, and to sing to the Lord. And we're to do it in spirit, as you mentioned, with truth and with understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't just sing songs to God that we don't understand what we're saying. Um, And if we don't understand them, how can we determine if they're truthful? Um, now why you might be thinking like, why is all of this so important? Um, a congregation learns their theology, not only by the preaching that they hear, but by the songs that they sing. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you heard me. I'm going to say that again. It's really, Uh, really a congregation learns their theology, not only by the preaching they hear, but by the songs that they sing. Yeah, A.W. Tozer, I think, said a really great great quote on this idea. He says, the only book I place before the hymnal is the Bible. And what he's saying is that uh, a classic, like time-tested hymnal filled with like dense, biblically-centered, gospel-centered, Christ-exalting songs that have been tested through time um, is a critical book for the Christian life. Um, And, and, I think a lot of the church has kind of missed that, you know. Yeah, I think just you saying that reminded me, I think one time you're telling me about a old theologian in one of your um, seminary classes shared that most of his theology was learned by hundreds of classic hymns that his mother actually had him memorize by the time he was like 12 or something. Yeah, he Um, was was, uh, giving a, a, a message um, that I watched during one of my seminary classes. And he's just talking about, he's like, I got, I came into seminary and I, I already had like a framework for all this stuff. And I realized that it was just because my mom, when he was a little boy, made him like write out the hymns and sing them. 
and he, he just again attributed so much of his theological framework just to the mm-hmm. songs that he sung and they're written on his heart yep um another point that we cannot forget is what the Bible has told us in Ezekiel twenty eight thirteen about Satan. And I'm going to go ahead and let you read that for us. Yeah. It's a, this yeah. is a pretty powerful thing when I put two and two together. It's like <laughs> things that I knew, but then when you're sharing this with me, I was like, oh my goodness, mind blown kind of moment. Like yeah. Why didn't I see that before? So go ahead and share. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So the, the Bible in Ezekiel twenty eight thirteen tells us something about who Satan is prior to, Uh, to his falling. Um, And the passage I'll read right here, it says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. And it's just a, if you guys catch that timbrels is like a Israelite or Hebrew percussion instrument instrument and pipes is obviously could be flutes or or some sort of musical instrument here Mm -hmm. and so this is the passage that scholars tend to believe that um, identify Satan as a musician Mm -hmm. so Satan was involved if not the leader of all music in heaven Mm -hmm. Um, that said we are not to be shocked (laughs) that the enemy would attack the very thing that he was gifted with and appointed to do Mm mm-hmm so that was just crazy to me. I'm like, of course, like I knew that, but I just didn't put the thing together. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's where we're having this conversation. Of course, he's going to attack worship music. Yeah. Of course. He knows it. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think that the church can be very naive of his, when I say his Satan, of his use of music to distort theology. Um, all of Satan's tactics and strategies can be basically narrowed down to one objective, which is deception. Mm hmm. Um, what better way to deceive God's people than by captivating their hearts with a song, a song that's beautiful, um, where they repeat over and over and over again ideas that are actually unbiblical. Mm -hmm. And he's not looking for lyrics of blatant heresy. He's looking for lyrics of subtle heresy. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's a counterfeit. He wants to make it look so close to the real thing, to the almost true, almost right, but not quite. Yeah, to be a good counterfeit, you you got to look like the real thing. Yeah, so, yeah, he wants to go after music that sounds Christian, but when put next to the scriptures, falls short. Yeah, it just falls short, exactly. That's a really good way to, to uh, explain that. So I'm going to give you guys a few examples of some songs that you guys probably know that... Um, I just put a quick list together. Uh, there's probably several more over the years. I remember like oh yeah, there's a ton out there. But hearing Christian songs, I'm just like, what did they? They, I can't believe they just said that. And I like go look up the lyrics online and go, this is not right. So um, I'll start with Hill songs. Uh, what a beautiful name it is. And um, and again, I want to point out real quick that you know, just if one part of a song is heretical. Um, the whole song gets heretical. The problem is, is that like a, a whole chunk of these songs are actually really great, beautiful in terms of their, their meaning. It's the same thing with like a pastor, right? If a pastor gets up on stage and gives a message, but like, you know, just two or three of his statements were totally heretical and untrue, mm-hmm. the pastor is held accountable to the whole sermon that you can't preach false doctrine. Mm-hmm. That's not to be done. You will be corrected on that. So even if one or two lyrics you know verses in a song stanzas if you will are incorrect it really does make this song a dangerous song Mm -hmm. and so hill songs what a beautiful name it is Uh, there's a lyric in there that says you didn't want heaven without us so jesus you brought heaven down okay this is very bad theology um this teaches people that the Trinity, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were not sufficient and were not satisfied with each other. Mm. Okay? You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. Um, th- this, um, it, it implies, again, that they were needy. Like, uh, yeah, that Jesus was needy. Th- yeah, that Jesus was needy. Ultimately, it, it makes man the solution to God's problem. To God's loneliness. Yeah, yeah. This is a very unbiblical view of God. And um, I- I'm going to tell you why. Um, 
we don't have a needy Jesus. We don't have a lonely Jesus. Um, God is not miserable without us. Okay. Uh, the, by the Bible's definition of who God is, he is self-sufficient, self-sustaining, and self-existent. God needs nothing. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is what makes the creation story even actually more beautiful. The fact that he did create us through the overflowing love of the fellowship inside the Trinity. That that overflowing love actually w- was, was it occurred. Again, it's, it's not because they were lonely in heaven. That's not the reason that God created mankind is because they were lonely. That's not what it was. Oh, he didn't, you wanted heaven by yourself or you didn't want to be in heaven all by yourself. You're so lonely. Oh, okay. Let's just create so man. he created me. He created me. I'm, gonna, I'm the solution to Jesus's problem. That's, that's an unbiblical view. And again, it's just small, subtle things, but we're ultimately here in this podcast training you to catch this kind of stuff. And you can't catch this stuff unless you know the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, example number two. Uh, elevations, uh, elevation worships resurrecting. I actually heard this last night. So this is like, I just heard this when we were in the car. We we're listening to Christian radio. And again, if it was Christian music, I, I give it a little bit of a pass. However, this song is absolutely sung in churches across America. Um, and it says, our God has robbed the grave. Our God has robbed the grave. That was one of the lyrics. Mm-hmm. Um, God did not rob the grave. Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> yeah, God did not rob the grave. He resurrected his son. Mm-hmm. Um, God is not a grave robber. Okay, that, that's not the, the lyrics that we want to be kind of playing into our, our head that God is a grave robber. And again, this is artistic language, and I understand what, what they're trying to say there. I get that. But it's lacking a reverence for yes, God. Yeah, he's a holy God. Yeah, God's not a thief, okay? God's not a robber. Um, you would not call God a robber when you when you set, stood face to face. So again, you got to be careful when these things, remember we worship God in spirit and in truth. And language and words do matter. Uh, when I prepare a sermon, I prepare a sermon because I'm watching every single element of what I say. Um, I don't get a pass, like, oh, just a little bit of false ideas in here. That's not okay. Um, okay, next, I got two more examples here. Uh, Bethel Music's Reckless Love. Um, again, as an artistic piece of work, it, you know, it can be an enjoyable song um, in terms of just the orchestration of the music. Um, I like the guy's voice. Um, but again, we've turned this into not just a Christian song, but a worship song mm-hmm. at so many different churches. Um, again, artistic, but it's not it's not truthful. Our God is not reckless. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, the, the problem is, is would the song have been so as popular as it was if you called it perfect love? Probably not. Um, but that's what the title should be. It should be called perfect love because that's really what God has is perfect. He doesn't have reckless love. The truth is that we are reckless. Yeah, and so yeah, people like that song because it identifies with them. It does. It, what we do is that it makes God like man. Mm-hmm. That's why we like the song so much. Oh, I'm reckless and so is God. Like, I love that. You know, that's the kind of... And it's it's subtle. It is. Like, it's uh, subconscious. Yeah, and, and he, God's not like man. And the classic hymns never portray God as a needy, robber, reckless God. Mm-hmm. There's artistic language in the classic hymns, but it's all reverent honoring to the Lord. The Psalms are again reverent and poetic. Man, they're the most beautiful poetry on the planet. Mm -hmm. They use artistic phrases, but they don't call God a needy or imply that God's a needy, robber, and reckless. Um, That is not truthful worship. That is the human heart operating without truth. Mm -hmm. That's what you get. And again, that's why the Lord needs to be worshiped in spirit and in truth in combination. Last one is uh, Jesus culture. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. You guys have heard that song. You've probably sung it at church. Um, And first, um, there is not one place in the Bible where people pray or talk to the Holy Spirit. And so that's just one thing that they're doing in this song that has no biblical reference for. Um, We're to pray to the Father through the Son. That's the, the biblical narrative that we're, we're to do. Um, second, the Holy Spirit doesn't need to be invited mm-hmm. anywhere. 
and we do not command his movement in the world. Um, and thirdly, he fills people, he doesn't fill places. Um, we do not see a New Testament example of the Holy Spirit filling a building by the request of the people of God. Um, now, there's the Old Testament idea of the temple being filled with the Spirit of God. But again, we're in the New Covenant now, different covenant. And I've, I've seen people lead this song and start literally calling the Holy Spirit to come fill the room. Um, and again, this tells and teaches doctrine that you just don't see in Scripture. It's extra biblical at best. Mm -hmm. And so we just need to be careful about that there. There's a, a whole theology on the idea of filling and indwelling uh, on, on the Holy Spirit. And it's really important to understand what that means. We don't have time for it today. But it, it proves that the people who are writing these songs, while they are incredibly gifted, um, incredibly poetic, um, their, their giftedness and their, their artisticness doesn't equal maturity. And this is a, a, a kind of a theme that Veronica and I have learned over the years that uh, spiritual giftedness doesn't equal spiritual maturity. Mm -hmm. We think that, man, look at that guy teach. He's such a gifted teacher. And wow, look at that song that he wrote and the guitar that he can play and the voice that he has. Spiritual giftedness doesn't equal spiritual maturity. And it's actually really dangerous if you don't watch yourself because you, you need to have that spiritual giftedness that honors the Lord. Ultimately, we get to use our gifts God's way, not our gifts our way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm almost done here, and then I'll hand it over to Veronica. Um, now, I, I know some of you guys are probably thinking, really, Dale? Um, you're really worried about a few subtle, incorrect lyrics in a song? Um, mm -hmm. And and yes, yes. I, I am worried. It's a slow fade. It's a slow. Small, incremental thought pattern changes. Exactly. And that's where. And eventually, you know, you know, one thing after another, after another over time. Yes. It's dangerous. Exactly. Uh, it's exactly true. And so, uh, and, and not because I want to be kind of the worship police either. Like that's not my desire here. Uh, but because scripture calls us to worship in spirit and in truth and to do so with understanding when we sing with understanding. And um, if you want to understand doctrine and then read those lyrics, you go, well, yeah, I can't, I can't reverence the Lord properly with those lyrics. Therefore, I can't sing those songs to the Lord um, in, in terms of a worship manner. And uh, 1 Peter 4.11 tells us a really important passage. It says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God are the truths of God. Mm -hmm. If anyone ministers, let him do so with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom the to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Matthew 12, 36 through 37, and kind of goes on to this idea of how important our words are. It says, But I say to you that every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Words matter. Um, they really do matter. Yeah, I think of the book of James when it says, uh, let not many of you be teachers for you will incur a stricter judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and a worship leader is a teacher. They usually call him, you know, that's the worship pastor. You know, yeah. yeah a worship leader is a teacher. Think about it, you know, right before the pastor comes up onto the stage, uh, when the pastor leaves, who is there? Yeah. And right before they get there, who is there? Worship um, leader. The worship leader. And in many cases, uh, they are equal in their weight to grow theological understanding. Um, I want to stop you for here, because especially because how much time do we spend on worship in the church today in comparison to expository deep teaching? Mm -hmm. It's like 45 minutes of worship songs in like a 30 minute message. So you're like mm -hmm. learning more. Interesting. Yeah. In your worship than I you are. That. Yeah. So that's the problem. We've allowed the um, artistic to overshadow the academic in terms of having an understanding of rock solid theological truth. Mm -hmm. um, a pastor does not and should not take artistic liberty when preaching God's word and neither should the worship leaders. Um, so if you bring a song to church, you are in fact bringing a three to five minute teaching. Yeah, that's what you're doing. If you're bringing a song to church, and what do they do at church? They put it up on the screen and you get to read the lyrics. And again, when, 
the whole church is standing there reading the lyrics. They're teaching, especially if you're new to the faith, as you mentioned earlier. You're reading it and you're it's believing it. It's one of those it. things, again, you're writing it on your heart. Yeah, and you're repeating it over and over and over mm-hmm. again. Um, so I want to add a one more point to this conversation uh, that's a pretty important point. I was concerned about including it, but I think it's really important. Um, music seems to be the Trojan horse for the enemy today, mm-hmm. um, especially worship music. And he's getting thousands of churches to buy into the theology of a certain church mm-hmm. through their music. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for example, um, Bethel Music has a lot of very popular Christian artists on their label. Um, I mean, very popular artists that have been in the Christian space for a long time. And all of a sudden, you find yourself singing Bethel worship songs um, at church. And, and because of this, um, many just blindly accept Bethel's overall theology. Like, mm-hmm. well, if my church is going to sing their songs, you and know. I love their music. I love their music. Songs, you know, yeah. um, affirmation by association. You know, you know they, my church affirms this because they have their music here. Then their, everything else that Bethel might do should be good as well. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this has, again, happened also with Hillsong. This has happened with Elevation. Um, and, and music is the front door for many deceptive uh, theologies today. Um, it's a lure that uh, leads, you know, to much more than just an artistic song. That's that. There, there's more behind that. It's a kind of a seducing step to kind of drop your guard to a more uh, serious theological error that's going down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not saying that everybody at Bethel or Hillsong or Elevation are all heretics. That's not what I'm saying. But I will say that there is some theology in that group of churches that I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. Um, Are there Christians inside those churches? Yes. Um, But there is a movement going on that's starting with the music. And that's what I want you to catch. Um, And so bottom line, the only reasons pastors or worship leaders uh, can even offer incorrect teachings and songs is because their congregation doesn't know what correct teaching is. And this is a call to not accept, you know, those teachings that do not glorify God according to Scripture. you got to read your Bible, people. And if for some reason they are corrected, I've heard specifically of somebody at one of these churches, they get kicked out of the church. They're not welcome back. If, if, if they were challenged. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, meaning that, that they brought a challenge to the doctrine and yes. they were removed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, guys, we live in some interesting times, and mm-hmm. music is a big part of it. And um, the, the, the good news is this. It's not like you don't have any other options for great music. Um, yeah. There are literally thousands of contemporary and classic worship songs, like some new stuff and old stuff, uh, that, that speak nourishing doctrinal truth mm-hmm. that you can sing, that you can give to your children, that you can fill your home with. And there is no reason for any church at this point or any Christian to just accept a song uh, that doesn't meet the theological truths of the Bible just because they couldn't find anything else. You know, so I I just want to leave you guys with that is if anything that this episode opens up your discernment Mm -hmm. on evaluating each song that you sing to your heart, to the Lord in worship, is it done in not just spirit, but also in truth. Amen. Okay. We'll close that off with that. Uh, just that's that note right there. Um, guys, thank you guys for listening today. If you guys, um, again, uh, would be willing to leave a review for the podcast, uh, they really do help the exposure of the show. The reason so many people have found our show is because our show has so many reviews. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and sometimes people leave really negative reviews and um, come in and, and leave the one stars and and fight against it. So for those of you that enjoyed the content, um, those positive reviews really also help balance that out. And so um, it is important um, if you if you really do find this episode or this podcast edifying for your walk with God. Um, again, if you guys want to look at the notes for the show, you want the scriptures that we reference in this episode, just go to relearnchurch.org forward slash listen, and all that will be available for you there. On that note, we will see you guys 
next week.